In this lesson, we're gonna talk about the fundamentals of images, which I think a lot of people feel like, hey, images, not that complicated, easy to add to websites, but there's actually a lot you have to learn and a lot you have to understand because there's a ton of people making mistake after mistake after mistake. And these are very, very costly mistakes in terms of website performance, SEO, accessibility, the list goes on and on and on. And I do not want you making these same mistakes. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna do this in a very practical format. I'm just gonna start adding images to the page and we're gonna talk about this as I go. It's gonna be a little bit like you're getting hit with a fire hose again, but it's okay. You can go back and rewind. You can slow the video down, whatever you need to do uh, to be able to digest this information. I'm gonna give it to you straight and it's up to you to sort it out from there, okay? On a normal website, we have a header. And inside of our header, we have a logo, typically. And that logo gives us the opportunity to start talking about some very important concepts like image formats. You may be familiar with JPEG, PNG, SVG maybe. And we're gonna use this logo opportunity to discuss the pros and cons of these different image formats to get started with our lesson. So I need to insert a logo right here. The first thing I'm gonna do is go to logoipsum.com and I'm gonna download a placeholder logo. If you're familiar with lorem ipsum placeholder text, you know the text uh, clients always complain about, they're like, why is my website in Latin? Like, calm down, Bev, uh, it's just placeholder content, okay? This is like placeholder logos and they, they look quite good. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this one right here. And you're gonna notice something when I do show in Finder. Let's just inspect this real, real quick. This is an SVG file and it is six kilobytes. That's tiny, that's very, very, very small. And this is actually the appropriate file format for something like a logo, which is an illustration. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. And this is, like I said, the appropriate format for this type of image. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open Figma because I wanna make a point here, okay? I'm gonna do new design file, and I'm actually gonna pull this file into Figma, and I am going to export it as both an S a, a, a JPEG and a PNG. So I'm gonna grab my logo right here. We're gonna go to export PNG and we're gonna put those in downloads and we're gonna put the JPEG version in downloads as well. And so now I have three different versions of this logo. I'm gonna go ahead and add an image to the page. I'm gonna select my image. I need to upload it now, all three of them, drop them in and let's add the JPEG first. So I'm gonna insert the JPEG and you're gonna notice a big problem. It's got this white box. What, what is the deal with the white box? Well, the JPEG format does not support transparency. And this logo obviously has a transparent background and it needs a transparent background. So we can see that JPEG is not an appropriate file format to use for a logo like this. Now, a lot of you, I've seen this mistake many, many, many times, will say, well, Kevin, that's no problem. Uh, my client gave me a PNG version. Okay. Awesome, there's the PNG. Now, what do we notice? Well, PNG supports transparency. However, it still has some limitations. Notice that the logo is a little bit fuzzy. It's a little bit fuzzy. Um, so, you know, any, any optimization plugins that you have installed or even WordPress itself tries to optimize images a little bit uh, when, when you upload them has an effect on the quality of the file. And so right off the bat, we can see that's not the most appropriate file format to use, even though we still get transparency. Also, this is a raster uh, image type. And so that's not a scalable image type, right? Uh, so if I try to make this bigger, let me go to layout. Let me go to 50, let's do 50 rim. Make it real big, 500 pixels wide, more or less. Look at the amount of pixelization, artifacts, blurriness, blockiness. This is a lot of things going wrong with this image file. Now, let me swap it to the most appropriate format, which is SVG. And take a look how sharp that is. Take a look how, even, even at this size, the file size is tremendously small, it's tiny. Now, I can even go bigger with this. I can go uh, 100 rim. 
still scales indefinitely and, and maintains its quality throughout the entire range. I can go back to being small if I want to. Uh, let's do five, let's do 10 rim right there. So that's like 100 pixels wide, still looks good there. So for responsiveness, looks absolutely fantastic. Goes up, goes down, no pixelation, no artifacts, no blurriness, no nothing. And SVGs come with superpowers. So I can, in, I can insert an SVG as a normal image, just like I did the PNG, just like I did the JPEG, or I can insert the SVG as code. Now, depending on the builder that you happen to be using, this might be easy or it might be a little bit more difficult. In Bricks, it's super easy. They have an SVG element. And what this will do is it allows me to select my SVG and it converts it to code, okay? So I'm gonna show you this, I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna go to the front end. We're gonna inspect this really quick. And we're gonna see that there is an SVG and not an image. It's not an image element, it's an SVG element. And look at all this path information. There's fill information in here. And so what this means is I can actually manipulate this image on the fly. I can change the fill color. Now the default will just change the fill of everything. If you notice the logo itself is actually two different colors. But if I want to using custom CSS, I can manipulate that color on the fly separately from this color on the fly. I can manipulate those colors on hover. I can actually animate aspects of this logo independently from other parts of the logo, all because it's an SVG, all because it's not actually an image, it's just code. Um, so that is really, really, really powerful. You cannot do that kind of stuff with JPEGs, you cannot do that with PNGs, you cannot do that with next gen image formats like WebP or AVIF. This is only superpowers related to the SVG file format, which is absolutely fantastic. Okay, so that's SVG versus PNG versus JPEG. As we can see, anything that involves illustration or scalable vector graphics, you need to use the SVG format when translating those over to the web. Do not convert those to JPEG. Do not convert them to PNG. Use the SVG format. Now let's talk about real images with contextual value. Think like a photograph, right? So this is gonna give us a lot of opportunity to talk about various concepts. Number one being, don't just go grab photos from anywhere. You're, I see people grabbing photos from Google Images and uh, they'll, they'll go into, um, uh, what's that social media application where everybody pins stuff? Pinterest, Pinterest. They'll go into Pinterest, grabbing images from here and there. That's the best way to get your client or yourself hit with a lawsuit, hit with a mean letter from a, a lawyer that's like, why are you using our copyrighted images? You might wanna have to pay us a fine for that. Uh, you don't wanna be in hot water for copyright violations. You need to make sure that the images you are using are either original proprietary photos, get your client to commission photos for what they need. If that's not applicable, you can use stock photos or what are called royalty-free photos from a reputable stock photo site. So Unsplash is a site you can get royalty-free photos from. I'm going to go ahead and download us a photo. So I'm gonna look through here and I am just going to grab this one right here. So I'm gonna download that. And once again, we need to inspect this photo and see what's going on. One thing I'm gonna notice right off the bat is this is an 8.7 megabyte photo. I'm also noticing that it's 8,000 pixels wide. This photo contains a tremendous amount of data and information that we do not need for the web. Now, if you wanna blow this up to a billboard in Times Square, you need that data. If you just wanna put this on a website, you don't need that data. So what we need to do is pre-optimize this image before we ever think about uploading this to WordPress. We need to pre-optimize the image. A lot of you are gonna say, Kevin, I got a plugin that does that. That does it all for me. It's no problem. It does it on the fly. Here's the thing. You're making that plugin and your server do a lot of extra work that it should not be doing. And think about uploading dozens and dozens and dozens of photos like this. You don't wanna be putting that kind of load on the server. You don't wanna be putting that kind of load, like you're, you're using up a tremendous amount of hard disk space on the server that does not need to be used up. You need to pre-optimize your images. I'm gonna show you two ways to go about this. The first one is free, the second one is paid. So I'm gonna go to squoosh.app. 
I believe this is owned by Google. Look how fast I can pre-optimize an image. I'm just gonna drag this in, hit resize, put this at 1920. It's gonna drop the quality a little bit. That's part of the optimization process. I'm gonna go ahead and export it. I'm gonna view this in the finder. Look at this, 380 kilobytes now and it's only 1920 pixels wide. That is pre-optimization of the image. That is 100% free. I'm gonna show you a second method. This is actually the method that I use, and it's an app called PhotoBulk. It's part of the Set App family of uh, apps for Mac. So I just have a subscription. I get all these really cool apps as part of the subscription. This is one of the apps. Uh, but I can take this full res image right here. I can drop this into PhotoBulk. And it's, it's going to uh, analyze the image real quick and then it's gonna bring it in. Remember, I can do one photo with photo bulk or I can do, it's called photo bulk because I can do like hundreds of images with photo bulk all at the exact same time, which is fantastic. I've got some presets here, like it's gonna automatically size it to 1920. It's gonna keep the same exact quality. It's gonna rename it. I'm gonna rename this um, travel or something like that. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit start and I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. And then it's gonna go ahead and process the images. Of course, right now there's only one. And we're gonna take a look at the image as soon as it's done and we're gonna see what has happened. So I'm gonna open the folder. 517K, 1920 pixels wide. Remember, this is not fully optimized. This is pre-optimized. And I can do that with dozens and dozens and dozens of photos all at the same time with photo bulk. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Now that I've pre-optimized the image, I can actually upload it. So I'm gonna go insert an image and I am going to, ooh, nope. Before I hit upload, let me go back into the admin and we're gonna take a look at two plugins that I, I, I would recommend you install these plugins on every single website. One is called Happy Files Pro. The other one is called Short Pixel. What Happy Files Pro is gonna do is it's going to allow me to organize the photos that I upload. I will tell you, WordPress leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to media management. There is no way to organize photos and it becomes an absolute junk drawer nightmare very, very, very quickly. Happy Files Pro also gives you some superpowers as well. So let's first take a look at Happy Files Pro. I'm gonna click on the media library and you're gonna notice right off the bat, looks a little bit different. There's this folder system on the left-hand side. I can go ahead and create a folder, what they call a category and I'm gonna call this branding. And then what I can do is I can organize my branding files by dragging them into that folder. And now I can keep those separate from all my other media. What I would also tend to do is create something like placeholders. All of my placeholder media can come in here. You know how valuable this is? You, you use placeholder images everywhere and then the client approves the design, yada, yada, yada. They send you all the real photos, you swap them out. You still have all these placeholders uploaded that you don't need. You can simply open the placeholders folder, delete everything, and now you've cleaned up your media library. There's no more placeholder data in there. Absolutely fantastic. You can create um, categories for your services, and I can drag these around. I can nest them under other things, whatever I wanna do. Um, so I can create services. I can say like uh, roof repair. Uh, if I'm doing a roofing site, there's my roof repair photos under my services. Very, very, very good for organization. And another superpower, I can actually, these are queryable objects. So I can query every, every image inside the services folder or every image inside the roof repair folder. Absolutely fantastic. I can actually assign images to multiple categories or multiple folders if I want to, kind of the same way that Gmail uses like tagging. You can apply multiple tags to a single email. Really, really powerful for organization. And last but not least, it actually allows you to use this type of organization everywhere. Pages can be organized. I don't have it turned on right now. Posts can be organized in categories and folders within Happy Files Pro. Um, your templates within Bricks, it is really, really, really powerful. So highly recommend Happy Files Pro. Now let's talk about Short Pixel. Short Pixel is the image optimization plugin that I use, and it does two primary things. Number one, it re-optimizes every image that I upload. Number two, it serves images to visitors in next-gen formats like WebP. 
you really, you're, you're gonna be working with JPEGs and PNGs and SVGs. Out of your JPEGs and PNGs, those need to be served to visitors in the WebP format for best optimization and performance. But the thing about WebP is it's not supported in every browser and every device. So what we need is a system that detects the browser and device and says, ooh, your browser supports WebP. So we're gonna serve you a WebP version of all of our images. And that happens on the fly. And if they don't, then we serve them the JPEG or the PNG version. And ShortPixel does that all for you automatically. Now, there is a little bit of setup involved. I'm not gonna go into detail in this particular video because everybody may use a different tool. Um, but I will do a video on, I've done a video on setting up short pixel. It's in my blueprint plugin video. Definitely watch that if you haven't, but I will do a specific video on setting up short pixel for engine X servers, because there is a, a few extra steps that you have to do. If you're using Apache, I don't think you have to do those extra steps. So again, it's, it's a situation where this doesn't apply to everybody. So it doesn't make sense to do it in this video. But the point stands, we need to be serving visitors with WebP whenever possible. Um, and if they don't support WebP, serve them JPEG or PNG that are fully optimized, which ShortPixel is also going to optimize. Um, ShortPixel, by the way, also generates the WebP files. So I upload a JPEG, it says, okay, cool, JPEG optimized. We're also going to generate a WebP version of that photo for you, so I don't have to do that. And last but not least, I'm gonna hop into WP Codebox. I told you guys, Firehose, okay? I add this snippet to every single website, which generates additional image sizes for me. And you're gonna see why these come into play in just a second. But I just uploaded, let me go to, oh, oh, actually I didn't upload it yet. Let me delete this right here, delete category. Okay, we're gonna go to placeholders. Let me delete this one right here. Placeholders, and I'm gonna upload, add new, we're gonna upload my little uh, photo here that I got, Travel Zero. And this is the pre-optimized version, okay? I'm gonna edit this so we can see it's 500 KB, 1920. I actually don't have short pixels set up on this site, so it's not gonna optimize it any further. Um, but if I go back to the media library here, we can take that and put it in placeholders. See, placeholders, separate from branding. Ah, very nice, very organized. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do, you're gonna see where these other sizes come into play. But I wanted to show you, I uploaded one size. But on the back end, that little script actually generated a bunch of different sizes. Look at this dropdown. Look at all these sizes that I have to choose from. And Short Pixel would optimize every one of these sizes as well. And the reason I need this is if you don't have these sizes, you're most likely gonna be putting full res images into small spaces like this. This is a grid. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save, view this on the front end. Does this need to be a 1920 pixel image like this? Pulling that full file at 517 KB? No, 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 no. The rendered size is only 435. So what I can do now, because I generated these other sizes, is I can come in and say, you know what? The 480 version is gonna work perfect here. So I'm gonna just select the 480 version and not the figure tag, the 480 version right there, hit save and then refresh. And look now, it's actually pulling a completely different version of this photo, 480 by 320.jpg. So it is pulling only the size that is actually needed for that particular space that this photo happens to be in. Also, let's go back to the DOM. We need to talk about all of this code that you see here. Why are there so many links to so many different images within one image tag? This is called source set. So I want you to imagine for a second, or in fact, we don't have to imagine. Let's take the grid off of here and let's make all of these 1920, okay? And actually, I'll just go down to one image now. So there's one image and it's loading at 1920 for this space. It actually only needs to be like 1600, like 1536. Let's do that, save, refresh on the front end. So there it is, 1536 pixels is the image being pulled here. Now, here's the thing about this. On a mobile device, do, does that need to be 1500 pixels? No, absolutely not. So there's something called source set and Bricks applies source set by default. Any good builder is going to do this by default. 
even though this is more modern. So if your builder's lagging behind in functionality, it may not do this, okay? But what this is doing is saying, it's defining all of these image sizes, and then it lets the browser choose the appropriate one. So on a mobile device, when I do this and bring this down, look, the browser is gonna say, hey, we don't need the 1500 pixel version of this photo. The, the width of this device is only, 487 pixels or something like that. So it's gonna choose from the list of available options the most appropriate image to render for the visitor. This is responsive images on the fly and maximizing performance. You need to be making sure that your builder is outputting source set code for your images. It's S-R-C-S-E-T, source set, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go back and we talked about images. Oh, uh, oh, no, we didn't. We didn't even get to the contextual value part yet. We've covered everything leading up to this. Now we need to talk about the fact that this is a real image versus what we're gonna talk about next, which is a not a real image, a CSS background image. Okay, so let's go back to the DOM. Anytime your image means something, it has value. Think about a product photo, a service photo, a headshot of a team member, something with real contextual value. It must be inserted on the page as a real image. So I'm gonna inspect this. This is a real image. It has an image tag. Now I'm gonna show you a fake image. I'm gonna come down here. I'm gonna add a container. And what we're gonna do is make this container 500 pixels high. So I'm gonna say 50 rim. And then I'm going to add a background image. We're gonna use the exact same image, okay? And then I'm gonna talk, let's talk about CSS background images real quick. And then we're gonna compare the two. So I get a bunch of these controls over here. I can say the background image should not repeat. I can choose what part of the image I want to see. I wanna see the center center. I wanna cover it. I wanna basically cover the entire container with the photo. Now, if I do contain, here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna contain it in the container, but not take up the entire container because the aspect ratios are different. Now, in this situation, I could choose to repeat it if I wanted to, and it will repeat the image. Uh, I'm gonna stick with no repeat. I'm gonna go back to cover. I could even, by the way, go custom say, hey, I want this to be a 20 rim sized image. And then I can actually choose how it's positioned, top left, bottom right, really, really valuable controls, honestly. And this is why people use CSS background images. It's probably the first way they ever came across um, manipulating images within a container like this. They don't really know any other way to do it. So this is what they stick with, but it's bad, bad, bad practice, felonious behavior if, your image contains contextual value because this is not a real image. Let me show you, okay? I'm gonna go no repeat, cover, and back to center, center. Save, let's go to the front end and get out of mobile mode. Okay, let's come down, here it is. Looks like an image to me, doesn't it? Does it look like an image to you? I'm gonna inspect it. And we find out, womp, womp, it is a div with nothing inside of the div. There is no image. So to a visual user like me, a real human being, I can see an image there. Works for me, but I'm not the only person using the website. What about Google? Google, very important, isn't it? For SEO and stuff like that, you want your website to rank. You want Google to understand what's on your site. And Google's got a bot, it, it doesn't use humans. They have little bots called spiders that crawl the website and they crawl the HTML code and they're looking for data. And that's why these semantic tags matter. It needs to know, the bot needs to know what is a section, right? What is a figure? What is a paragraph? What is a heading? What level heading is it? What is a list? What is, is it an ordered list, an unordered list? Our semantic HTML code informs the spiders how our site is laid out, what content is on our site, what content is more important than other kinds of content, and screen readers, actually blind people using a screen reader also need to know what data is on our website. Otherwise, they ain't gonna buy from you. They're not gonna convert. They're not gonna have a good experience. This is not good, right? So we need to make sure that we're using real data. Well, guess what? 
the spiders, the screen readers, they don't read CSS. This image is defined purely with the CSS background image property. It is not a real physical element in the DOM. This is the DOM, D-O-M, document object model. We've talked about that before. This image does not exist to anybody but a visual user, okay? And that's a bad thing for images that need to exist, that, that actually have real data and we need to be able to describe them. Also with background images, I can't use alt tags. I can't use figure tags. I can't use source set. We just talked about source set, right? None of these things can be used with background images. So now I'm gonna go back up here and we're gonna see a couple differences, okay? First, we already saw the image tag within the code. I can also wrap that image tag with what is called a figure tag. And a figure tag has actual semantic value. An image tag is like a div. It has no semantic value. It's just a reference to a file. But when I put it in a figure, it's saying, hey, pay attention to this. This has value, okay? It has extra value. It's extra important, let's say, if I was just explaining it in beginner terms. Also, what comes along with the figure is the ability to have a fig caption, okay? So I can actually associate a caption of text with a specific figure element. Very, very powerful. Also with images, real images, I can use alt text. This describes the photo to spiders and non-sighted users. So I can say that this is a road winding through desert with mountains and yellow stripes uh, in the middle. Okay, you literally, you literally describe the photo, okay? And you could even say asphalt row. Like the more descriptive you can be, the better, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Let's refresh and now let's see the differences. So I'm gonna inspect this and we can see there's my figure tag. There's my image tag. Here's my alt text. Well, it auto scrolled me. Here is my alt text right there. Asphalt road winding through desert with mountains and yellow stripes in the middle, okay? Here's all of my source set information. There is a lot going on. Let's check on that CSS background image. Nothing, nada, zip, zilch, does not exist, except if you have eyeballs, okay? That's the only way that you know that it exists. So when would you use a CSS background image? The only time you're allowed to use a CSS background image is when the image is purely for decoration. We do not need it to have an, an alt, uh, alt text. We do not need it to have a figure tag. Nobody needs, if, it, if a, if a non-sighted user, a, a spider from Google, a screen reader comes down the page, they don't need to know that this image exists because it's purely for decoration. Think like a background pattern image. Like, let me, let me get one. Let's go to background pattern, something like this. There you go, right there. So this is a perfect example. Now th this photo of this road, some people will be like, well, that's purely decorational. Well, is it, is it? It's kind of creating a vibe, right? It, 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 and it may support the information. It depends on how the image is being used. That's why it's, un it's important to understand the context, right? But we gotta argue here, right? If I'm gonna do this, and I, I did not pre-optimize this image, so look how long it's taking. Okay, it's, it's only 439 or 493K, but watch this. Let's go squoosh. Let's just do our process, right? 1920, we don't need 6,000 pixels of information for this. Now it's 91K, okay? Let's refresh here and let's delete that permanently. Perfect, all right. And let's upload, oops, did that wrong. Let's hit add new. The media library leaves a lot to be desired in WordPress, okay. So I, I just uh, did that. Let's go back to the library. Let's put that in placeholders. And there you go right there. And this is, let's open that up, 89K after being pre-optimized, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we are going to select that image. Bam, boom. That's a decorative image, purely deck. There is no information that anybody needs to glean from this photo. It is purely for decoration. That is a good case for CSS background images. I actually put that in the wrong spot. This is our background image right here. Let's go to style background and swap that out. Perfect use case for a background image. Okay, so now we understand the difference between HTML images and CSS images. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes you want a real image, 
to behave as if it's a background image. You want to overlay text on it, for example. And in this situation, this is the thing that gets people into trouble. They use a background image because it's easy to overlay text and it's easy to create the darkened overlay effect or a gradient overlay or what have you. And they lose all of the contextual meaning because they use CSS background image when they should still be using a real image. So I'm gonna do this both ways so that we can compare and contrast. One way is easy and it's the wrong way. The other way is a little bit more technical, but it's the right way and you are learning how to be a professional, which means you are gonna go the extra mile and do things the right way. Here we go. So I'm gonna call this um, BG image like that. And I'm gonna call this real image, just like that. Um, yes, that'll work, okay? So the BG image is gonna be a height of 500 pixels, which I'll just do 50 rim. And we're gonna do the same thing for the real image, a height of 50 rim. That's our container, okay? Remember, we're trying to create overlay text effect. This could be a hero situation. It could be a, 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 a fancy card that you're building. Doesn't really matter. On the background image, I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to, I'm gonna do this at the ID level. I'm gonna add the background image here. And we're gonna use the, let's use something with more value. Let's go here. And let's say I was doing uh, snorkeling lessons, okay? Let's just say snorkeling. Okay, so oh, there's there's a, there's a girl snorkeling right there. So we're gonna show our snorkeling lessons in action. So let's go through our whole process. I'm gonna download this. Let's go ahead and pre-optimize it. So I'm gonna drop that into Squoosh. We're gonna resize to 1920. And we're gonna let that run. I'm gonna download it, perfect. Now I'm gonna come back, let's close that. Let's select the image. Let's upload the optimized version, perfect. Let's insert it. There's our background image right there. I'm gonna say that this needs to be a little bit bigger. So we're gonna say the 1536 pixel version. We're gonna show me the center center. We're gonna do no repeat. We're gonna do cover. Look at that. So we are showing an image of a service. This has contextual value. We're doing this wrong. This is the, remember the top is the wrong way. Bottom is the right way. Next thing I need to do is add an overlay to this. So I'm gonna grab BG image. I'm gonna come down to gradient overlay. I'm gonna apply an overlay. I'm gonna choose a dark color like this. And then I am going to drop the transparency of that color. And now I've darkened the image. Now remember, this is just a container. So if I wanna add overlay text, all I have to do is add a text element into the container. The image by default, since it's a CSS background image, is already in the background. So what I'm gonna do here is call this uh, snorkeling lessons. And we're gonna apply a class called overlay text, just like that. I'm gonna make this a paragraph tag, and then I'm gonna style it. We're gonna make the text white, we can make the text uh, six rim. I'm not gonna use clamp and all that. We don't need to worry about it. It's just demonstration purposes. Font weight, we're gonna go with uh, 600, make it a little bit bolder. In fact, I want that to be more like four rim, five rim, somewhere in there. And now I just position the text using Flexbox. So we're gonna say position this to the end, to the right side. And then what I can do is add some padding to offset it. I'm just adding padding to the container, not the actual text itself. Let's do something like five rem, 50 pixels on all sides. Look at that. Perfect overlay text, super easy to do. Now, that's the wrong way to do it. Why? Because we have a card, more or less, that's all about our snorkeling lessons. The image is important to the context of this card. But if I inspect, what do I see? I see text called snorkeling lessons and Google doesn't know there's an image here. Screen readers don't know that there's an image here. Only sighted users, humans, know that there is an image there. So this is objectively the wrong way to do it. Source set, no. Alt tags, no. Figure tag, no. None of that can be used because this is a background image. Now I'm gonna build it the right way. This is the little bit harder way, the more technical way, but it's the correct way. And now you're gonna know. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We've got real image, 500 pixels high. We're going to insert an image, a real image in that container. And we are going to select the exact same image. Perfect. I'm gonna also say that we need to render the 1536 pixel version of this. I'm gonna wrap the image in a figure tag. I'm gonna give it some alt text, okay? Girl taking snorkeling lessons in the Bahamas while photographing 
coral reef. Woo! Man, I just described that whole image real quick like. That gives Google screen readers a lot of really good information to chew on. I'm gonna say no caption for this particular photo, and then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to hit save, okay? Now we can actually do the overlay text with the fig caption. Nah, that's that's more fire hoses, okay? We're just gonna do normal text and, and keep it simple. Now, notice that the image here is actually making this container taller. Because it's a real image, it's moving other things around, right? I can make this behave though as a background image by changing its position to absolute. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to, and I know we haven't done absolute positioning, relative positioning or anything like that. Uh, we're gonna do BG image, double underscore image, just like this. We're using BIM, okay, for our class structure. And now what I, what I can do is switch this to position absolute. And what you're probably gonna notice is that it breaks out of the container, it gets all out of whack. And if I do like 100% width on here and I do 100% height on here, my gosh, the bad things are happening. Bad things are happening. And now all the beginners are sweating bullets. They're just, they're like that, the pilot in airplane. <laughs> Don't worry. It's so, this is, is, you. this stuff becomes second nature to you very, very, very quickly, okay? Right now, this is happening because nothing is containing this image. I need my real image container to contain this absolutely positioned element. I do that by setting the position to relative. And now look, things are starting to, to take shape more or less. But I do have a new problem. The image is being stretched, okay? I can use something called object fit in order to make this, finish making this image behave like a background image. So I'm gonna go to the image itself, BG image, image, object fit, cover fixed. Okay, now this image is a real image, but it behaves like a background image. I can even change its object position. I can say 50%, 100%. That'll show me the bottom of the image. I can do 50%, 0%. That will show me the top of the image, just like background images works, okay? I'm gonna say 50, 50, because I want it to look exactly like this version up here. And let's go ahead and save. Now, what are we missing? We're missing the overlay text and the darkened overlay. Well, the overlay text is no problem whatsoever. I can still, I'm still working within a container. I can still just add text. And I already have a class called overlay text. So I can just go ahead and put that in. But you do see, I'm gonna call this snorkeling lessons. And you're like, where is it? Uh, I, I put it in, but I don't, I don't see it. Well, our image is actually covering it up. So I need to do a step of telling our image to be in the background, okay? Now, we've talked about axes before. The X axis, the inline axis, the Y axis, the block axis. We also talked about, at one point earlier in this course, a Z axis, which goes from your eyeballs straight through the computer screen in the form of layers, right? So I need to put this image on a bottom layer using Z index. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to Style, Layout, Z index minus one puts it on the bottom. And now you can see our text, okay? Now I can grab my real image container. Then I can go up to style. I can go to layout. I can do my same padding on all sides. And ooh, what is going on? Let's go back to our image and see that we missed a step. Whenever you absolutely position something, and again, we're gonna cover this in more detail on a future lesson, you have to give it coordinates. I want it to attach to the top of that container and to the left of that container. And now everything is positioned properly. The only thing we're missing is the darkened overlay, which we can easily create. So now I'm gonna come in and I am going to add a div and we're gonna call this overlay. This is not the only way to create an overlay, by the way, but it is a beginner friendly way to create an overlay. All right, and we're gonna call this BG, uh, we're gonna call this real image double underscore overlay. And we're gonna position this absolute as well. So absolute, and here's a trick, top, right, bottom, left, we'll make a div the exact size of the container that you're working on. And now we can add a background color to it. So we can add that same dark, we can drop the uh, opacity down. But we see this, oh no, it's covering the text. Z index to the rescue, minus one Z index. And now guys, check this out. We have an exact replica. I'm using a different overlay color a little bit, but an exact replica. Big difference though, inspect this one. 
No data. Zero data other than the snorkeling lessons paragraph. Inspect this one. We have, open the div. Oh, there's a figure. Open the figure. Oh, there's a real image with source set with an alt tag. It's wrapped in a figure tag. It's like, there's so much more going on here. This is the proper way. This is the non-proper way. This is the chump way. This is the pro professional way down here, okay? So I wanted to make sure that you understood how to accomplish that. Again, absolute relative positioning, we're going to cover again in a uh, future tutorial more in depth, and that's gonna help you out even more. Uh, but this is gonna be part of your homework today. You're gonna be able to follow along with this video and hopefully make this thing happen right here. Let's talk about additional mistakes to avoid with your images. Number one, do not use a design tool to add accent items or background colors or gradients to transparent images. Never, ever, 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 ever do that in a design tool. Always do that with CSS. Number two, don't use a design tool to manipulate an image's saturation or opacity or crop aspect ratio, blur, border radius, contrast, or anything else in that family of, of visual controls. Always use CSS instead. Don't group multiple images within a single image file. People do this all the time. Excuse me, chumps do this all the time because they don't know how to position individual images. So they drag them into a design tool, position them, and then export it as one image and just upload a single image. Oh my gosh, absolutely felonious behavior. 10 year minimum sentence over to rehab. Do not do that. Same with adding text to images, 10 year felony minimum, off to rehab, never add text to images. It doesn't scale properly, can't be read. Uh, if you ever change the font, the font in the image is not gonna change. Bad, 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 do not do it. I will wet noodle you all day long. 100 lashings with a wet noodle every time you do that. On top of your 10 year felon. In fact, 100 lashings daily with the wet noodle for all 10 years of your prison sentence and then on into rehab as well. Okay, don't use copyrighted images. We already talked about this. Always use original images or royalty free images. And last but not least, don't use images for design elements that can be accomplished purely with CSS. Remember back in a previous tutorial, those chumps on that landing page, they used a transparent PNG blurred colored blob. It was like 500 kilobytes just for a, a background blur type thing. And I was like, what kind of chump behavior is this? And then I made the exact same effect purely with CSS pseudo elements. No 500 kilobyte PNG file, no nonsense, no shenanigans, just professional behavior, right? That's what I did with pure CSS. If it can be done with pure CSS, my friends, do it with pure CSS. Okay, your homework. One, download a full resolution image from unsplash.com. Whatever you wanna work with, doesn't matter to me, you choose. Number two, pre-optimize the image with squoosh.app. Number three, upload the image to WordPress. Number four, organize that image with Happy Files Pro. This is kind of a bonus step. Number five, recreate the overlay image from above. You need to create the real overlay. In fact, I want you to do both versions. Create the wrong version and then create the right version, just like I did here, okay? It, you can use the whole same theme if you want to or do whatever you want, go off the, off the uh, beaten path. It's up to you, up to you, just do your homework, okay? Make sure the image is using source set. Make sure the image, the real image has an alt tag, okay? Make sure it's wrapped in a figure tag. Absolutely fantastic behavior. Number seven, make sure the image is being served to the visitor dynamically as WebP. You can use short pixel to do that if you need help with that, because I know we didn't dive deep on that in this particular tutorial. My, my inner circle is happy to help you. Either myself will jump in or any of the numerous amazing people in there. There's over, you know, 1,200 people in there now. Um, you know, experienced developers and beginners alike. It's a fantastic mix all over the world. And you post something, people will jump in and absolutely help you pretty fast, pretty fast. So, um, but you got to be a member of the inner circle. Oh, links to all this stuff is down below. Or you can just, you know, I don't know, maybe ask chat GPT. Like, I, I, it's up to you. But find a way to serve the images dynamically as WebP. 
You can't just upload a WebP version and serve that because that's not how this is done. It's gotta be dynamic based on their browser or device. That's why I recommend ShortPixel. All right, that's it for this. This was the fundamentals of images. I hope that you guys learned a lot. If you have any questions, drop them down below in the comments. Make sure you hit like on this and I will be back very soon with the next lesson in the Page Building 101 series. Peace.